UNS. You can go read that. You can certainly get it as a part of our morning newspaper brought to you by Planet Fitness as well as our friends at the Maryland Jockey Club and Laurel entries for the weekend. Luke Jones has been riding shotgun here for the better part of a decade as our Orioles insider. And Luke, piece to piece, uh, conversation to conversation. I'm going to talk about every aspect of this with you over the next 30 days as we sort of take a little break from football, a little break from uh, celebrating the Stanley Cup and lacrosse. And uh, I know there's some golf going on this summer and some other things, but baseball is what has sustained us as sports fans here for all of our lifetime uh, in Junes and Julys. Obviously, this is a different kind of June and July, and that's one of the reasons my dear Orioles uh, series is coming along and you know we wrote a piece to to the organization and whomever owns it now I got to take on the guy that owns it and look I've written 14 chapters on the Peter principles you can go read the history you can read my thoughts on the history but at this point whatever Peter Angelos is good bad indifferent where the organization is it really has taken on the personality of its leader over the last couple of decades, for better or for worse. And in writing a letter to Peter Angelos, I I know he's not answering it. I know he's not allegedly making any more decisions, but certainly the decisions he's made have put this organization where it is right now. And it's not a good place. And I don't know that he's certainly not going to be the guy lifting the shovel to fix all of this. It will be his legacy. But but what is Peter Angelos' responsibility in all this, Luke? Well, in any line of work, in any business, it starts at the top. And whether you're setting the tone for the rest of your organization, the rest of your business, and everything kind of follows after that, or whether you're not making good decisions at the top, and there's a trickle-down effect. And even if things can be good in spite of that for periods of time, uh, ultimately, that's not going to sustain itself. So I, I think in the case of Peter Angelos, I mean, we're talking about a 25-year period now. I mean, it, it was 1993 when uh, he came in on a, on a white horse, and not really come in because he was local ownership, and that was such an important uh, reality at the time for uh, people in Baltimore uh, in the aftermath of the Colts leaving town uh, less than a decade earlier. And it's set up to be something really great, and I think there were good intentions from the beginning, but it hasn't worked out uh, in a way that Peter Angelos or Orioles fans would have envisioned 25 years ago. Uh, and I think the lasting legacy, and we know this legacy is much closer, you know, this, this era is much closer to the end than the beginning now uh, with a, a, a man in his late 80s, but it's going to be looked at as a very frustrating time in the history of the organization because of all the things that the Orioles had going for them, new ballpark, uh, much more payroll flexibility than m- many markets in, in Major League Baseball, uh, even look at you know, well, the, the, the Masson deal and, and what that was going to be, uh, or was at least hyped to be, and you know, those, those things just didn't come to fruition for nearly enough success as anyone would have wanted in that t- period of time, including Peter Angelos. Well, and he's made a lot of money. Uh, You know, I mean, I'll say that. I mean, beyond all of this, it is a business, and the money sits in his pocket. And, you know, as much as we'll talk about Chris Davis pilfering money, it's certainly money he could afford, right? So, uh, you know, that money was going to go to some ball player, whether it's uh, Bobby Bonilla in the old era or, uh, you know, Albert Bell or the insurance company back in the day taking care of the lion's share of that. Uh, You know, we, we do say, well, these guys make all this money. Peter's not flaunting the money he's made, but he's made all the money. You know, it hasn't been in the papers, it hasn't been talked about, but the the real legacy is he pulled $29 million of newfound money out of his pocket uh, in in a courtroom in New York and has put well in excess of $2 billion in profit into his pocket and really hasn't done a whole lot of winning on the field. I mean, it it hasn't been about winning. It hasn't been about running uh, a community-based organization or a great television award-winning network. This has been about doing it in the shadows of taking money off a cable television bill and being sort of a, a, a you know a legitimate 
a, a monopoly for large stretches of time uh, before the, the football team came in. He had that going on for a couple of years in the beginning where all the money was his. But there's been a lot of things that have whittled away at this, but nothing's whittled away at the bottom line, which is the bottom line, profit. Uh, there's been plenty of that for Peter Angelos, quietly. Yeah, and, and I think that's been more so the, the last decade plus than prior to that. I mean, Peter Angelos, for a long time, I, I don't think it could come into question that he wanted to win. Now, the means of going about doing that and decisions made, certainly we can debate, and you can go back to Davy Johnson and overruling Pat Gillick. But I, I think in that period of time, when you're talking the pre-Masson uh, Orioles uh, under Peter Angelos, I think it was about wanting to win, but I think questions or, or decisions that were made over that period of time uh, made that difficult. And certainly, you had aging players, and you know they had 1996 and 97, a bunch of hired guns, and then you had uh, the Cal Ripkins of the world that were, were nearing the end of their career. And you know, I mean, for a long time, Peter spent a lot of money. For a long time, the Orioles uh, were right up there. Of, you know, they had the top payroll in baseball at one point. So. You know, I, I don't want to say it hasn't been about winning the, this entire 25 years because I think that would be inaccurate. Well, he lost uh, a lot of money. I mean, I, sure. you know, and that's, and that's not been point. reported by anybody but me, quite frankly. Like, that is not well known how underwater Peter was in 1999, 2000, 2001. And then specifically, when 2002 came, all of the 10-year deals on the suites came up and everybody left at once in 2002. So that's when the, the, the profit really went 20, 30, 40 million dollars of money was gone. The fans were gone. The TV revenue was gone. Um, and between that three and five and six period, that's when everything changed when Masson came along right. and was really a lottery ticket for him. I mean, you know, had the Montreal Expos gone to San Juan or gone to Mexico City or gone to Las Vegas or gone wherever they, they could have gone at that time, Portland, Oregon, it really would have changed everything around here over the last 15 years because Peter would not have had that profit center. And, and that that literally funded a lot of the good things that happened around here with the winning with Buck Show Walter in recent years as well because they wouldn't have had a $150 million payroll if they didn't have $212 million of mass and revenue at their feet every year. They didn't know how to make money on this. They didn't know how to do this. I mean, it, it really masked and deodorized a lot of the issues here What was how much money the Washington Nationals threw off for them. Yeah. Uh, and I hear you on that. I don't disagree necessarily, but it's also hard to say what the future would have would have held there. I mean, think about it. Uh, another team came into a market that had been his for a really long time. Now, you're right. Uh, from that point uh, in 2002, you're talking post-Cal Ripken. You're talking uh, Camden Yards being, having been open for a decade at that point. So there wasn't really the novelty to go out there and see uh, baseball's best ballpark over and over and over if you're not going to have a good product on the field. In the same way that that might have held true in 1992, 93, 94, etc. So, you know, I, I think what you say absolutely has merit. On the flip side, what would have happened had there been one team remaining in Baltimore or in D.C. Uh, as had been the model before? So, I mean, it's I hear you, and there's definitely validity in that. But at the same time, I'm not so sure that the Orioles flounder forever if the Nationals never come to D.C., because that is such a large market that, you know, at some point in time, you'd like to think you'd start winning by accident, almost, you know, in the way that they kind of did in 2012, I guess, if you want to make that argument. So, I mean, it's definitely complicated. And again, you really go back to this idea of, what the Orioles were under Peter Angelos for 11, 12 years, and then what they've been in the Masson era. And it really is one of those defining moments for the Orioles and defining moments for baseball now as we're, what, six years into a Masson dispute with no end in sight at this point still. <laughs> well, and the Masson money is now over $400 million, and... If we're of the mindset that Peter's never going to make a decision again at his age and where he is, then it does fall into the laps of the boys. And I guess my question is, 
the things that he's done and undone and the crimes and the banning of media and the intimidating of people and the international baseball stuff and the dealings with the agents and the fudging of the medical records for every pitcher that came through here to try to lowball them like he did with Gallardo even recently going back to Xavier Hernandez and all of that plus all the problems he's had with his partners he has literally sued every partner in Major League Baseball including the Nationals people think this is just a Nationals lawsuit it is not it's about millions of revenue that affects the Milwaukee Brewers and the Oakland Athletics and you know tens of millions of dollars that's their money too in regard to the revenue share that they they are all in business together uh, and that's the way it works and right now this is the lowest boat clearly on the field and what that represents this year but but what is the long term when they're out trying to hire a general manager this offseason, you know, beginning with Ned Coletti and trying to figure out where that is, that they can't get anybody to leave a safe job with the Texas Rangers or the Colorado Rockies to come here because no one's going to leave their current job to come here and work with Brady Anderson with stirrups and a jock strap and one side of the locker room and taking pictures out to California and doing God knows what uh, with the boys saying, yeah, we, we, we want Brady doing that. I don't know what manager digs that. I don't know what baseball man digs that. And, um, and Peter has allowed that. The boys have allowed that. I don't think the boys have done a better job of running it than Peter if Brady's in here gumming things up. And the old man is telling Dan Duquette, you can't go to Toronto. Everyone knows these stories. Everyone is caveat emptor and buyer beware to take a job in this organization. And there is no obvious manager that's going to manage this team next year or obvious baseball man who is going to take this job. And I think the sins of Peter will haunt this franchise until such point where whomever the next owner steps in and says, I'm not Peter. And I guess when I get to the Dear Orioles part of this next week where I go after John and Lou Angelos, who you don't know, I don't know, there's been no movement for anybody to know them or feel them or be up close. And look, I saw Ted Leonsis take over uh, the, the parade down in D.C. Uh, earlier in the month and what ownership represents and you know how the buck does stop at Steve Bishotti, and when you and I see him on a sideline as we did last week talking to Eric DaCosta, we know the owner's involved, and we also know when he sits in front of us, he's not a dumbass. You know what I mean? We, we talk to him every year. He knows what's going on, all the ins and outs at the league level and officiating and what fans want and hearing fans and alluding to things he's seen on social media and what customers are saying and what the upper deck represented in the emptiness uh, his head's not in the sand and he's been somewhat accountable what what i like to hear from steve Moore, sure um fine but he's not this isn't the wizard of oz anymore where you're going to operate the team with no cue in the community, no front end, never being asked a question, never being accountable, never being accountable to the, the people that stroke the big checks at the bank level and the hospital level and the airline level that support your organization, uh, and, and touching the fans. That, that has been something in this generation that's been lost, that Edward Bennett Williams, at least through the players and Larry Lachino and what Boot Powell and Brooks Robinson and old Orioles represented, that helped them when Camden Yards opened 25 years ago. I don't know where that push is going to be because they don't have Brooks Robinson or really Cal Ripken to help them sell tickets anymore. They, they, don't, they don't have any goodwill. And I guess that that's the part where Peter and what he has done to me, to my business, to my family, to my community, to people I know uh, in the aftermath of everything that's happened here from L. Rod Hendricks and Mike Flanagan and, and, and how Brooks Robinson has been treated and how people I know have been treated. They're, they've got a long way to go to erase some of that to win some people back and then they just have the inherent problems that you and I go through every day with baseball and the time of the games and the, the mobile society and they don't stream their games and all and, and they are a bad baseball team and all that but Peter specifically 
this era, at some point, Peter can't own the team, won't own the team, and someone else is going to sit in that chair, and they're going to have to undo a lot that he's done, but this is going to have to be done a different way than we're going to suck $4 off of your cable bill, make $150 million a year in profit, and get tax benefits, and never answer any questions, because the era of that is coming to an end. Because if the team gets bought by somebody else for $2.1 billion, the new owners are going to need to put asses in the seats, treat people right, win back the community, win back people like me that have been pissed on for a quarter of a century. And Peter will never own that because, you know, we're long past the point, but his kids are going to have to own it, and the next person in is going to have to be better at this. And I guess that's my point of Dear Orioles, which is, when are you going to get better at this, at all of this? Yeah, uh, and I mean, that's fair. I mean, we, we've talked, we've been having this same discussion for the last decade, uh, you and me, and you've had it longer than that with other individuals. You know, I, I, a couple things come to mind for me at this point. I mean, Peter Angelos is 88 years old. He, the, the end of his time as owner of the Orioles is much closer than him being in the, the midst of you know, just the run-of-the-mill day-to-day, being in his office every day, you know, how involved he was, you know, how much was he meddling, all the different things that we've talked about uh, for years and years. You know, that, that's coming to an end at some point here sooner rather than later. And you know, the thing that comes to mind for me, and you know, I'd love to hear your opinion on this, but I look at what's happened now recently with the Nationals, uh, with the transfer of power uh, within the Lerner family, and how that has to be something that is approved by Major League Baseball. Uh, when that time comes, whether it's when, when Peter passes on, whether it's uh, if his health gets to a point where he permanently uh, is no longer going to be involved, and, I, and you know, I've heard you and I have heard different things about his health. I mean, I've heard varying degrees of. You know, where he is from a health standpoint, and, and, and without hearing anything directly from someone to the family, I'd be uncomfortable speculating about that too much. But my point is, when the time comes when it's decided that he's no longer the principal owner in title and in a, an official capacity, how's Major League Baseball going to handle that? Are they just going to, without any question, giving the backdrop of the massive dispute and everything that's gone on in that regard for years now, are they just going to sign, it, you know, sign off on John and or Lou being in charge then? Or are you going to seek some kind of a power play? And that's something that's really come to mind for me just with what we've seen with the Lerner family here uh, recently uh, with the transfer uh, with, a, with an elder uh, owner to, to you know, younger members of the family. So you know, that's, that's something I look to. And, and to your point as far as whoever it is, whether it's John and Lou, whether it's some other owner at some point here in the not-too-distant future, you know, that to me is going to be the good litmus test as far as how much this community still does care about the Orioles. Because the reality is, and I said this to you in our previous conversation, Whoever the new person is cannot go back in time and fix things that happen. Uh, you, you can't go back and, and put John Miller back in place, and he was uh, the team's broadcaster the last 20 years. You can't go back and rehire Davey Johnson post 1997. So, some of that, there has to be an acknowledgement that you can't change what happened in the past, and it just needs to be a vow to be better in a number of ways for when it comes to winning, when it comes to how you relate to your fans, how you treat people, uh, how much transparency there is, all of those things. And, and really, from that standpoint, it, just, it needs to be someone that comes in and acknowledges that mistakes have been made in the past and acknowledges that it hasn't been up to a standard that you would hope to have uh, for uh, a, a baseball team in a community, any organization within a community that deals with the public. But, again, how much of that is going to be that person and how much of that is going to be people in this community that still care about the Orioles that have stayed away de- deliberately because of Peter Angelos giving new ownership a, a chance under that, that under that kind of an assumption. Well, then so, it becomes, well, who is the new owner? Is it some, you know, is it some prick like, you know, Jeff Loria that's going to come right. up here from Miami and come in here and, and, and you know, b- 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 Put the leech into the uh, into the skin and start sucking the blood out, or is it someone that is 
go to walk the walk and talk the talk because there's a lot to be fixed here, dude. They're not just going to roll the ball out. And, and I'm not even convinced that if they just rolled the ball out and somehow won, somehow Bundy and Gosman become, you know, incredible and some of these kids coming through and whatever deal they make for Machado and Jones, that, these play, that they make shrewd moves in the next five weeks. And somehow next year they have four or five ball players and can win 85 games. That if that happened, they're still not going to draw 3.6 million people and pack the place and become a sensation and become what the Capitals hope to be now that they've had that kind of a parade where you become this vibrant brand where... Businesses are buying your skyboxes. Your games are getting big TV numbers. Downtown's packed before and after game. What the Cardinals are, what the Red Sox are, you know, what vibrant organizations are, they're not that. They're far closer to being the Tampa Rays than they are to being anything that resembles a brand that is venerable at this point. It is a damaged, damaged brand, and someone smarter than me and you needs to own that and get out on front of it, but someone needs to be the Mark Cuban. Someone needs to be the Ted Leonsis. Someone needs to be young and vibrant and hip, and it you need to recruit the community to baseball in a community that's been playing lacrosse for 25 years, uh, in a co community where black and Latino people routinely do not show up at your games, uh, at, where no one is routinely showing up at your games under the age of 60 at this point. So there's a lot that needs to be done but like any other organization, and we were talking about Royal Farms and we we're talking about Coons Ford, and Dennis would say this, who's running your place? Who are the people you're bringing in? Are they best in class? Are they forward thinking? Are, are, where are they going to be in five years? Where's the organization going to be? And this thing here needs a complete and total brand heart transplant. It does not need Brady Anderson and John and Lou Angelos dicking around, hiding from people, continuing to offend people like me, continuing to offend the baseball world with this lawsuit, continuing to only be able to hire washed up retread baseball people that they can't bring in because no one's going to work with Brady Anderson and take him seriously. And they're going to have a moribund bankrupt baseball organization with whatever the remnants that you're going to inherit from deals from Manny Machado and Adam Jones and Zach Britton and Brad Brock that you didn't even make. So that's where the franchise is this summer. Oh, and by the way, they just lost 108 games or whatever that number is going to be. Here, Ned, take over. Who owns the place? Well, John and Lou. Well, what do they know? Not a damn thing. We know. How do you know that? They've been there 25 years, and they've made zero decisions that have been good, but they like Brady Anderson a lot. And welcome in. He's your new Kim Asabi. Get to know Brady. He'll really be calling the shots around here. I, I mean, Luke, it, it, it's a mess, right? I mean, that, that's what it is right now. That's the current state of what, you're, what Ned Coletti is coming in and finding when he's asking questions? Well, uh, a couple things here. First of all, it's one GM of 30 jobs. It's one manager of 30 jobs. And there's... There's an appeal to that. <laughs> there's always going to be an appeal to that because you have something that you can offer that are, there are only 29 of those. And in a given year, maybe only three or four other jobs uh, that, that can be offered. So there's that. I still think, and you're probably going to say I'm naive about this, but that's fine. There's still a lot of unknown about John Angelos and Lou Angelos, and that's not to say that I think they're going to do a great job, uh, but I, I think any of us uh, in any walk of life, uh, especially if, you know, if you're in a position where your father hasn't been viewed favorably and you know, very justified in many ways, uh, that doesn't mean that you're that same exact person. So there's an opportunity for them to write this thing uh, in some capacity, I'm not saying that I have a great deal of faith in that. I don't know en enough about them, frankly. But you know, to the point that you just made, any new ownership is going to have the same exact challenge. There's unknown. When, when you're talking about new ownership, when you're, you know, unless you're talking about two teams or you know, two owners that swap franchises and there's uh, you know, a known commodity kind of quality about someone, there's going to be unknown there. So uh, as it relates to the current infrastructure with Brady Anderson, sure, there, there's a challenge there. You would have to find someone that uh, is going to 
have to sit down and like Brady and get along with him. And you know, I don't think that's impossible, but certainly uh, it, it's it's not a structure that's been clear cut, and there hasn't been a chain of command the last few years, and you know, really hasn't been that way since Dan Duquette's flirtation with Toronto and. The, 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 the waters have just been muddied that much more. So there are absolutely challenges here. I don't know if it's necessarily as irreversible and completely damaged as we discuss it right now, but that only becomes the case if you hire the right people. That only becomes the case if John and Lou Angelos have learned a thing or two from mistakes that their dad made over the years. Well, there's uh, one thing that's a reality. The the reality is they're not going to be a very good baseball team anytime too soon based on everything we know about baseball. You know, like, they can hold out whatever miracle they want for whatever kid they have at Delmarva right now uh, and whatever they're selling about the the next outfielder that's going to come along and be Al Bumbry or whatever. But this, for on the field, this isn't going to get cleaned up quickly cheaply, easily. They couldn't clean it up if they had all the money in the world. And by the way, they have all the money in the world. They have enough money to sign Manny Machado. They do. They, they, they could give Manny Machado $380 million if they wanted to. And we can discuss the merits of that with Paul Olsen, with Chris Davis, and with you know any of those kinds of contracts. It's not because they can't afford it. It's what are they going to do with the money they have. And so... They're not going to fix this by winning the World Series next year, right? So, so if that is where it starts, how do you begin to fix it? Well, I, I mean, all of these things we talk about, it's not rocket science. It really isn't. As much as we try to portray it and as much as we praise the Ravens, and the, the Ravens have deserved a lot of praise, uh, even with some of their missteps uh, in recent years, but they deserve a lot of praise for how they have acclimated themselves into this community beginning in 1996. But it's not anything genius that they do. I I think it's to have consistency, have good people in charge, treat people well, buy into being a member of the community. And, I mean, just uh, it's a a combination of those things. I mean, there's nothing terribly complicated about this. If you have good people at the top, you let those good people at the top do their jobs. Uh, You offer the, the appropriate financial commitment, which, again, I'll, I'll go back to keep saying this, and you know, I'll disagree with you a little bit from a standpoint of finding Manny Machado is not going to fix this thing because they've been in last place with Manny Machado this year. It goes way beyond that. Uh, but my point is they've spent money the last few years. Uh, they've spent more than enough money to win the last few years. They haven't spent it wisely, and that goes back to having good people at the top. That goes back to having a chain of command. That goes back to being cutting edge in terms of analytics, in terms of recognizing the value in the international market that they've completely sat out. Uh, Really, for most of Peter Angelos' tenure, save for a couple brief periods here and there. So these aren't aren't novel ideas. Uh, what What we're asking, what we're expecting out of the Orioles, out of anyone who comes in that would buy the Orioles or run the Orioles or manage the Orioles, these aren't such far-fetched ideas here. It's just uh, you have to have a recognition of what's largely been done for the better part of two decades. Has it worked? Yeah, they had a nice period here recently, and they deserve some credit for that, certainly, and Andy McPhail deserves credit for that, and Dan Duquette early on, and certainly Buck Showalter, and you know, you and by by extension, Peter Angelos giving those individuals at least some period of time to work uh, under at least better circumstances than there had been in in previous regimes deserves credit for that. But that said, there there was a lot of winning that went on that was masking things that still weren't right uh, as an organization. And now that the winning has gone away again, uh, it pulls back the curtain, and you realize that things still are, are far from where they need to be. If you want to sustain success, if you want to garner more appeal uh, from a, a local standpoint in terms of support and goodwill and all those things we've talked about that are you know, certainly not there right now with an empty ballpark with a last-place team. But, uh, again, I'll go back to this. Anyone, hypothetically, that comes in, uh, if, if Peter Angelos announces tomorrow he's selling the team, 
new ownership. First of all, you hope it's someone that's invested in keeping the, the team in Baltimore because there are worse owners. <laughs> there could be worse situations than Peter Angelos. Uh, I'll just caution everyone about I don't know that, that anybody in the baseball world now that there's anywhere wonderful to take a baseball team where you could plop it down and print money. Didn't we go through that 15 years? I mean, the reason it got plopped down in Washington was because yeah. Peter did a poor job of running the Orioles on behalf of Washington. He had that market and didn't do a great job with it. Didn't do a great job with the team. Didn't, yeah. It wasn't a great owner. Um, it, you know, if, if whatever was happening in 1992 and 93 and 94, the Orioles would have been treated like the New England Patriots, you know? They would have been a regional franchise, and they would have felt like the Boston Red Sox or the St. Louis Cardinals, who are a regional franchise. Right. The, the Orioles unregionalized themselves through an owner who's been a jerk and an owner that's messed up a lot of relationships and uh, an owner who was about himself in the end that has made a lot of money being uh, you know, a fighter and all of that stuff. But now how do you undo that and win back a community that at one point you took the word Baltimore off the team? I mean, I remember this stuff. I, you know, I, I know not everybody remembers this stuff, but then you're going to come back and give the community a warm hug when you ran from the community for years. It, it's... It's also very weird to me, and I have such a sense of history about all of it and having watched it all unfold. So I, have a, I don't judge it on how I feel about it. The temperature isn't my temperature. My temperature's always red hot. My name's Aparicio. I'm a baseball guy. This is all I've ever done. I've built my life around it. I've built my business around it. I've built my character, my integrity, you know, my reputation, everything I've done I've built around this during a really horrible time for baseball here. And... I look at it and say, all right, that's the past. Now, what's baseball going to do about this? And is it going to survive here? And, and I do wonder, 20 years from now, Luke, whether you know, the franchise would be somewhere else. But I'm thinking, well, where is baseball going to catch on? You, you know what I mean? Where, they, they, they couldn't move a franchise from Montreal anywhere. They couldn't find a place to put it. There was they tried for five years. They put games in San Juan, in Vegas. You know they they, they would have tried Orlando at Disney World if they would. They wound up putting it there because there was nowhere else to put it. I I don't know where the Orioles would go to, quite frankly, if they were to move. But I know this is not sustainable. This summer and what it is from a from a Montreal Expos, Tampa Rays. I mean, they have other problems in baseball. The, the Oakland A's are a problem. I, I don't know what's going to happen to these franchises, but once the mass and money dries up, that revenue is going to have to come from the community to some degree, whether it's in skyboxes, in media, in ticket sales, web revenue, click-throughs, whatever it is in the future, they're going to need revenue and they're going to need to be important and they're going to need to be well-run because the next guy that takes over doesn't get $200 million a year in mass and revenue. He doesn't get 3.6 million people in the ballpark and a brand new ballpark. He doesn't inherit Cal Ripken in his prime. He doesn't get Baltimore and Washington and a whole regional thing. The, the new owner gets the keys to something that is very, very broken. And, sure. and, and a 30-year-old stadium and a bad reputation. And guys like me, that you don't need to sell me on bad. I love baseball. I just think you're a prick. And I'm not giving you my money. And neither is anybody else I know. So that's where it is right now. Where is it going to be three or four or five years from now for the new owner that takes over whatever this is, whatever the remnants of the Manny Machado trade and whatever damage Brady Anderson and John Angelo, whenever this gets good again, there's going to have to be some person at the top of it who's going to have to be really, really good at this because, the, as you pointed out, the deodorizing part of it's gone. They're now going to have to do this, dare I say, the right way, a different way, a new way, but they need to not only win back 50-year-old guys like me that can afford $20 bleacher seats, but they need to win fans that don't even know they like baseball and haven't met baseball the way the Capitals are trying to get a half a million people that don't own ice skates, that didn't do morning skates, that didn't play hockey, to care about hockey um, in, in a community up here where we have lacrosse. So I'm worried about that part of it because whatever it's John, it's Lou, whoever it is that runs it is going to need to be really good at this in order to make this work, because the hill is a lot more uphill than it's ever been for baseball, for the Orioles, 
in, in this city right now, moving forward, who can fix this? And I don't think it's John or Lou Angelos. I have no clues on that because the Brady Anderson thing to me is so weird that it tells me they might be even more effed up than their old man, quite frankly. Yeah, I mean... Because they've never worked a day in their lives either. Let's add that in, that their old man's had a billion dollars you know, for the last 35 years, that they've played rotisserie baseball and pretended to run a television network that threw off $210 million a year every year for a decade. So I, I, don't, I don't know that they're capable. I don't know what they're good at, but they're certainly not good at the takeover right now because it's sitting there and... They haven't done a good job the last 90 days, I'll say that. Well, but at the same time, we also can't be disingenuous here. You thought they were going to win 85 games. I thought they were going to win 82. No one, including them, thought that this thing was going to be this disastrous. And I don't even know, not even, not even some of the, the projections, the Bacoda, all, all the different stuff that uh, Orioles fans mocked for, for previous years envision them being you know 30 <laughs> games under 500 and uh, as we're approaching uh, you know in the mid not, not many things like in life were. are worse than advertised <laughs> right right but, but you know, i mean the points you make uh, i mean there's there's definitely concerns there again i'm i'm willing to give some benefit of the doubt because they haven't been in charge you know the, the last 25 years and no son is exactly like his father necessarily, and you can probably find uh, lots of business business examples where you know sons were better than their fathers, and the opposite, sons took over for fathers who were great uh, at running a business. And well, I've already got the headline. Business. The headline is: Are you Rocky or are you Bullwinkle? And Rocky meaning Rocky Wirtz. Sure. I mean, Rocky Wirtz took over the Chicago Blackhawks. It is this incredible. Jim Irsay, to some degree, if you sure. you, you look him sure. up, I mean, drugs and rock and roll aside, um, which is a, you know another part of uh, you know of his journey on right. Earth, and he would probably own all of that. You know, he has cr- created an unbob Irsay like reputation in Indianapolis. I mean, flags will be at half staff when when his day comes in Indianapolis because he's laid down the roots. He's changed the culture of what they do there, right? Right. So uh, so it. That, that's not to say that John and Lou Angelos can't make things better here, but uh, to your point, have they learned from mistakes of the past, or is it viewed as things are fine and they continue down the same road? Now, I think there have been some indications, and you know, I, I think we've heard John Angelos speak on, on various issues in recent years, that he's a guy that's at least thoughtful to some degree about various topics, uh, you know how that applies to the Orioles. Who knows uh, moving forward? But you know they've they've recognized what they're doing with uh, the, the the kids getting in uh, program uh, with, with adults, uh, kids getting in free uh, under the age of nine. You know there's value to things like that, and there needs to be more of that. And to the point that you made, there there is going to be a lot of damage that needs to be undone, whether it's the Angelos boys or whether it's new ownership coming in at some point. But on the flip side. There's, there, there are going to be some challenges that are out of ownership's hands from a standpoint of challenges that have faced this city in general and fewer people going downtown in general. And we've talked about that in the aftermath of uh, Freddie Gray the last few years. And I think there are a lot of concerns for this city in general from that standpoint. I think, you know, you, you mentioned uh, luxury suites. Well, how many, you know, how many fortune companies are, are in this city at this point? I mean, there's people that are average fans aren't buying luxury suites. So, you know, there, there are some definite challenges, and the Ravens are facing the same thing uh, to, to different degrees uh, that we're talking about with the Orioles right now. But uh, I think some of this, when, when, if and when that day comes when there is new, new ownership, I do think there is some responsibility that's going to fall on people who said for years, I'm not giving Peter Angelos any more of my money. I still love the Orioles. Well, if that day comes and he's no longer owning the team, and you know, whether it's you know, his, his sons or whether it's someone brand new, uh, ideally, someone brand new that's young and innovative and committed to keeping the team in Baltimore, well, then they're going to need fans to, to step up and follow through on that, too. And how much of that? Well, in the same happen? way when the NFL so, came here, we were all like, yeah, when a team comes, I'm going to buy tickets. And then they said PSL, and some people were like, 
hmm, right. you know, right, how, right. how much again? And, 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 and that's where we are, you know, 25 years into this thing, which how much are my tickets this year? And is it worth the 1800 bucks that I just sent over to Baker yep. and folks and, you know, wrote on my credit card for my two seats up at 513? Is it worth my money? And, and this community has asked that question about the football team in the sure. last six months. It certainly is fair to ask that about the baseball team at this point. And I, I'm going to keep coming back to this and you know this because this is chess, not checkers. Someone really good, someone really competent, someone smarter than you and me is going to have to be in charge of this thing because it's not easy lifting anymore. It's, it's not it's not going to be, we're the Orioles, F you, come and see us. That, that's, that, that's what he inherited in 1992. That's not what whomever is going to run this place, whether it's the boys, whether it's a new owner, whether it's Mama yeah. Angelos. The, the, the problems that they encounter, including the city and an aging ballpark and an aging sport and you know, all of that stuff, they, they inherit that. Now, what do you do with it? You know, how are you going to run this business in the best interest of the community because you need to recruit the community and someone's going to have to be recruiting the community. And I haven't seen John or Lou Angelos. They've been around 25 years. I've been around. I've never met them. I don't know many people that have met them. I don't know many people who know them. I, I don't see them out on the street. I don't run into them. I do you know, I don't have people saying, you should get to know the boys. They're better guys than the old man. And they're, good. they're running the place now. And they need guys like you back because you love baseball. They're, that's not, I'm not expecting that to happen. I, I'm expecting whoever would own the team to want to do that with anyone who's ever loved the Orioles because it's the right way to run the business. But they've never done it that way. Yeah, and uh, I mean it's it's going to be critical for them if and, and when that day comes when Peter is officially out of the picture uh, as being you know completely in charge. And we know uh, it's become pretty apparent over the last year, maybe a little bit longer than that, uh, that they have ga- gained more influence. I, I think we all would uh, agree with that based on reports, based on things we've seen, based on. John Angelos being more vocal, at least through statements and initiatives uh, with the organization than we've seen uh, in the past. But when that time actually comes, are they going to handle business in a way very similar to their father? Or are they going to put their own fingerprints on this? And if they do, are they going to do that in a positive way? I mean, you know, I, there are a lot of challenges, but there's still, you know, there's still things going that, that this that this organization should have going for it. And, yeah, I get it. Camden Yards is 25 years old, but it's still it's not viewed as outdated or obsolete or anything like that whatsoever. Uh, but at some point in time, you got to sell more than just saying, well, come to the most beautiful ballpark in baseball. Come to the team that had Cal Ripken and Brooks Robinson and, and Jim Palmer and, and Boog Pals out uh, in beyond right field cooking barbecue right now. Yeah, you got to do more than that, and that goes back to what I've said about being more cutting edge in terms of you know how you market yourself. I mean, this idea of not streaming your games and you're one of only a couple teams left in baseball that doesn't do that uh, when other teams have been streaming ha- having streaming for their games for years now. Well, I mean, not giving the game to the people who want it is silly. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean like uh, the idea that I pay for satellite to have mass in, and yet I can't then be on the go with my phone, with my laptop somewhere, and log in and watch the game. I mean, that's insanity. I pay for it even, you know? I mean, so we're not, I'm not talking about just streaming for free. You know, I, you know, it's something where people who want to stream the games will pay for it, but you're not providing a, a, a platform for them to be able to do that. I mean, that, that's just part of it. And I know well, that goes you know, back well to Rocky Wirtz's old man not putting the games on television in Chicago because he thought it would hurt them at the attendance. Um, right, right. You, you know, it's it's a mindset, and and the mindset of this organization for 25 years has been offensive. I mean, and it should be offensive to every. It's offensive to you, and you love the team, and you go down there, you support the team, but you, you can't help but be offended by the fact that nobody's running the place and nobody takes accountability for, for how the place is run. It's, it, it's, you know, the things we demand of the Ravens are far different than what we demand of the Orioles, really. Uh, that's fair. That's fair. But, uh, again, like I said... Because it's been so ineffectively run for a long time, 
I think we put the Ravens on a pedestal that anything they do is, you know, it's not rocket science. It's, you know, a lot of these elements are common sense. A lot of these elements are just caring about having good people at the top and then trusting them to do their job. And, you know, Art Modell and then Steve Bashotti uh, following that has allowed that to happen. I mean, I don't think the Ravens are necessarily geniuses in what they do. I just think... They're smart. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to belittle what they do. I think it's just a lot of what they do is it's common sense. It's what you sh- what should be done. It's the, it's the right thing to do, and we hear that all the time. And how many times uh, have we talked about the Orioles over the years in a number of ways where they failed to do the right thing? So whoever, you know, whether we're talking about the, the, the Angelos boys, whether we're talking about a new ownership, I don't think everything you come in and, and I, that it's got to be rocket science. I, I think these are some really common sense kind of things to do. And ultimately, uh, I'll, I'll go back to what we talked about when we kind of introduced uh, the, the, the Deer Oreo series. It, it, it does need to be about winning, though. I mean, you, you, can, you can give away as many bobbleheads as you want. You can get out in the community as much as you want. Uh, you, know, you can have prices that are reasonable. Uh, which you know, I mean, the, the Orioles haven't been the highest paid ticket, uh, highest priced ticket in uh, in the major leagues by any stretch of the imagination. They've been pretty affordable relative to a lot of places. But that all of that said, why do people care about a team? Winning has to be there, and as much as that sounds like a bandwagon kind of thing, I, I think that winning has to be in place, and I think the rest of the stuff starts to to really matter. Uh, you know, more so when you've won and then you don't win anymore after that. And all those other things are magnified because no team's going to win forever. No team's going to go through 25 years and not have a couple down periods. You know, maybe, maybe some teams are a little bit different than others, but you're going to have some times where the well dries up a little bit. That's when all those goodwill things really matter that much more. But ultimately, if you're going to be sustainable and profitable, it's got to win. Uh, you know, and, and, I, and I hear that and understand that. And I thought about this at the parade as I hold up the uh, Stanley Cup champs hat you don't here have that any I get to wear. for the Caps when they when they win the President's Trophy. They well, had a parade when they won the Stanley Cup. I, but here's here's my point, and and, and to your point. That there were five hundred thousand people out there under the Washington Monument, right? And I, you know, I had Mike Vogel on this week, right, from uh, Capitals.com. He's only got thirty-one thousand followers. You know, the brand of the Capitals had eighty or ninety thousand followers on Twitter, and somehow a half a million people showed up at the Washington Monument, took the day off, bought a red hat, bought a red shirt, came down, said, "I'm a Capitals fan, and this means something to me, and I want to participate." Now the question becomes, where are those fans the year that they're thirty? Four and thirty-nine, and don't make the playoffs and finish tenth. Three, fours, five, six, seven years from now, do, will this matter to those people in the same way that Cardinals fans are always Cardinals fans, and the Red Sox have finished in last place a couple of times over the last decade, and they don't go away, they don't patently go away, they stay in to some degree because it means something to them. And how long you stay in, and every Orioles fan was tested with this after 1997, right? How long do you stay in? You know, at when you start to lose, how? You know, how early are you out of it? Then you don't go to games. Then there's year two and three and four and five. I don't know that anyone can sustain that, right? Like what the Orioles went through and how bad it was and right. how awful the ownership was and how mean spirited, all of that. But for the Capitals who build something back up now that you actually have these people, what do you do with it? And the Orioles had people three, four, five years ago. We saw it. They were People were down there. Maybe it wasn't as big as it once was because they don't own Washington anymore or whatever. Then what do you do with it and how do you sustain it and keep it? And the Orioles don't have it anymore. They have to build it up. They have to get it going. That's a different thing. I mean, it's the same thing as uh, Buck Showalter. You know, do you want a guy who's going to manage a bunch of thirty-something-year-old guys who are ready to win a championship, or do you are are you going to have a manager that's going to manage young people? They need an owner now that's energized to find new fans, and while trying to get guys like me back. To some degree, because I'm ready to go back. I like baseball. I'm ready to spend money. I'm ready to feel good about it when they're ready to show me that they have a commitment to being different than the way they used to be. Um, and, I, and I think when you get those fans under that monument, as I saw last week for the Caps, 
where are those half a million people five or ten years from now? Because you're not going to win the cup every year. You're not going to win the cup maybe ever again. How do you keep those people engaged? And, and what is it, aside from winning, because you can't do that every year and you can't really even control that. You can try hard, but how do you keep them? And the Orioles don't have that anymore. And I think there's a different place and a different kind of way you have to run it when you know you're going to be bad and when you're trying to create and a message of integrity to say, we're doing things differently and better, and I'm going to show you every single day. And that's who they need to be. It's not who they've been. It's almost laughable the way I talk about it. But they need some sort of a brand takeover here. Yeah, and I think that's fair. And, and I mean, to the point you make, yeah, winning hooks new people. It's what you do after that that keeps new people. And... You know, that, that goes to customer service, uh, that goes to how you market the team, uh, that goes to, you know, community outreach. I mean, it's an all-encompassing thing. And uh, that said, if the, the Caps can do all those things extremely well, and if they stink for the next 10 years, none of those other things, you know, all those other things start to fade away then, too. <laughs> you have to win, and you have to win on some level, consistently enough that you're at least relevant and competitive. And, yeah, you can have a couple of down years here and there, but, you know, you can't have anything approaching like what the Orioles had from 1998 through 2011. And, well, you also, uh, also can't be smelling yourself if you're Ted Leonsis right now and saying, look, I own the world. There's a half a million people. Right. Do we cheat them in half? Let's right. screw right. them. Let's screw them. Let's get in. Sure. Let's suck every dollar out of them. Uh, you, you can't behave in that fashion. And... Um, and certainly the Orioles are in no position to behave in that fashion, but they've always behaved in that fashion of let's get everything we can get out of them that we can. And, and I philosophically, I've been offended by it forever, and I love baseball. I, I think philosophically something really massive needs to change here. Above and beyond, like, picking better baseball players, and maybe Brady Anderson's the next Ozzie Newsom for all I know, and he's a genius. Uh, you know, but I doubt that. Uh, I, I, they doubted that with Ozzie 25 years ago, right? But, but all that being said... That's all well and good that they can get better baseball players. They, they need a whole lot more than that because they can't control that right now. You know, they, everything else they can control, ticket prices, experience, all those things we've talked about. They can't control the weather, but they can control all the rest of it, and they need to control that and own it right now. They sure, do. sure. And, you know, that's where you look at, you know, that it's, it's ironic the timing of when they, you know, they started this thing with letting kids in free. Who knew it was going to be a year where they're going to looking like they're going to have to play really well just to avoid losing 100 games uh, at some point between now and the end of the season? So you have that. They have a decent promotional schedule. They got to do more though. You, you ticket deals. You know. Uh, you know, get, uh, I, I remember years ago they had Ollie's Bargain Night, and that's gone away the last two or three years. You know, they, they need more stuff like that. And we we were talking about that even when they were winning still a couple years ago. Uh, how you have to create incentives to get people to want to come to the ballpark. When you're losing, there's nothing you can do to market the team itself to get them to come to get people to come out and watch. Well, that's when watch. you market love of the game, and I love so, baseball, and I love drinking, and I love a night at the yard, and you know all of that. And uh, you know they've had a winning team to market the last five years. Right, right. So, so you just you have to work that much harder with other promotions, other ideas. You know, I mean they. Yeah, you know, they do fireworks now every Friday night from May to August, and that gives them a little bit of a bump uh, on a Friday night compared to what they probably would get if it was just a run-of-the-mill regular game. But you need more of that stuff, and you know, you, you give away as many things as you can possibly give away. And you know, if, even if it's a case where uh, you know you you give something uh, to people coming out the door, uh, which is something you know typically you think of giveaways, but you know why not uh, if you have nights where you only have 13,000 people in the ballpark. Why not hand people a ticket voucher on their way out saying, hey, thanks a lot for coming out. Come back again on us or you know, make it 50% off or, or whatever. I mean, those are the kind of things you have to do. Uh, it, at some point in time, you need to do things to fill your ballpark up to a point. And when I say fill, I don't mean 45,000 full. I mean 
that it doesn't feel like it's a morgue in there. Make somebody feels- get in the car in Bel Air yeah. or in Westminster and come down because they're not coming for a winning team anytime soon. We know that. Right, right. So everything and, and, about this needs to change. And and, and there's look, I, I don't know what the, the quantitative value is to that, you know, what the numerical, you know, what the dollars and cents value is to that. But if you do enough things where you're still able to draw 20,000 on a Wednesday night, which at this point, 20,000 on a Wednesday night, uh, assuming it's not the Yankees or someone like that, that'd be pretty impressive compared to where they've been. You know, if you can do those kind of things, then when someone does come to the ballpark for that once or the other second visit of, of the season, just because, hey, let's do a baseball game. It's a warm July night, and they see that there's actually some people there, and I think that that makes people more inclined to be more open to coming back in the future. Uh, again, this is complicated when you're talking about a team that is oh, yeah, yeah. You know, crashing well, well, towards 100-plus. No. Any ticket marketer out there is going to tell you there's only so much you can be able to do when it's this bad. Yeah, my time is more valuable than giving you anything to go over there for three hours and do it. Right. I mean, Luke, I mean, uh, we're going to be talking about this all summer long, man. So, uh, no, you know. Yeah, and we're not going to solve it overnight either. And we're not. <laughs> the Dear Orioles series is coming this week. Luke is going to be writing about all things Orioles and covering them uh, as we get up on the trading deadline, the All-Star game down in D.C., uh, the exit of Manny Machado. All of it can be found in the buyatoyota.com audio vault 24 hours a day from anywhere in the world on your mobile device by downloading the TuneIn radio app. We do come in crystal clear from anywhere in the world. Big shout out to our friends at Royal Farms. Real fresh, real fast with the Kona Blend coffee, uh, as well as the Rofo Rewards card. Make sure you're using the app. When you're pumping your gas, you'll get your fried chicken and your western fries for free. Uh, any breaking news happens first on the WNST Tech Service. It's all brought to you by Coons Ford of Security Boulevard. Dennis Colazzo will be here on Thursday driving you home. He is also reacting to my dear Orioles series. I want everyone to react, and I want everyone to think about what can the Orioles do? What should the Orioles do? What would you need them to do to be more supportive of them? Uh, I'm going to be focused on that over the next month. Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Snapchat, Instagram, and out on the web, Dear Orioles is the hashtag. I am Nestor. We are WNST.net AM 1570 and WNST Towson Baltimore, and we never stop talking Baltimore sports. <laughs>